Open their doors, please. Good morning, I'm Jamie Stepler. I'll be up first. <laughs> Uh, but thank you for your attention during the seven circles in the advising of technology. And the seven circles that we're going to go over are going to be the prospect system, career counseling, the application process, placement testing updates, financial aid, data tell, and web advisor. First off, the prospects. Um, we have a prospect system running in Datatel along with the applications and registration and all the other systems going on. But a definition of a prospect is an individual who inquires to the college but has not yet applied. So usually what they do is they submit an inquiry either through by a physical form or they do it through the website. And this is the website form that um, they would fill out. And then once they fill that out, it actually comes through the admissions office where we input that inquiry into Datatel. And then once we input that into Datatel, then this, we send them a general interest letter and then followed up a few weeks later by a department chair letter from the program that they inquired to. And then we also send them other college information. So for instance, if during their inquiry, they say, I want financial aid information sent to me. I want an application sent to me. We will send that along with the letters, the general interest letter at first. And then also, the admissions checklist is good for prospects to know. Um, off of our admissions website, we have our summer checklist up already. And this goes through the admissions and enrollment process. So the first three steps are really for admissions, application, transcripts, placement testing. And then they can apply for financial aid, goes over registering for a new student orientation session. And then the other steps down below um, are for was the dates for advisement, how to get your textbooks, parking permit, um, and other items, and also attending class at the end. So that goes through the whole process. When you pull up data, when you pull up ASUM, ASUM is where you can get test scores and look to see what admission requirements they have on file. When you see a PA, that means that it's a prospect. So for instance, on this example, this student is a prospect for the early childhood program because it has a PA status here. And department chairs do have the ability to pull a prospect list. So if they're really wanting to do some recruiting for the program, they have that ability to pull the prospects, send them letters, send them emails um, to get the recruiting effort going. For career counseling, that'll be our next circle. Um, when do you refer a student for career counseling? Uh, usually when a student doesn't have any idea what they want to do, or if you notice a student has had a lot of program changes. Um, that's more alerts where you want to send them to our career centers. We have a career center uh, on our Lee and Chatham campuses, and then we do have a presence a couple days a week at our Lillington campus. During that process, they'll do some career assessments. The career assessments we do will be career cruising, which is through the North Carolina public school system. ONET, which is sponsored by the U.S. Department of Labor. And then we'll also do the Myers-Briggs, and the strong interest as well. We do have time to do that with them because they're a little bit more in-depth career assessments. Uh, additional career services that are that is done through our career centers. Um, they do classroom presentations on career center services. They also do on-campus recruitment events. Um, we've had Cree, we've had Alta, Duke Energy is coming. So we've had a lot of area employers come to our college and specifically recruit our students out of certain degree programs. Uh, the career centers provide workshops, whether it be resume writing, interviewing techniques, career fair etiquette. And speaking of the career fair, our career fair is coming up next week on the 20th from 10 to 2. So the career centers have been very busy getting our students prepared for that event next week. I'll hand over to Jamie. Good morning, everyone. Jamie Childress. Um, I want to talk about the whole process when you're advising students. So obviously the first step is to complete the application. 
Now the college processes applications two different ways. We still do hard cap copy format, and then we also direct students through our online process. All applications are gonna go through the records office. On the other campuses, they may put in enough information during late registration to get the student registered, but then those applications come to the records office and we still have to clean them up and add more information. Now, the hard copy applications, those may come in when a student wants to actually apply same day and get registered for classes. We get a lot of those in that three day ad period or the two day ad period where, ooh, gotta get this class now. So we do a lot of hard applications then because we can typically key them in in maybe 10 minutes, enough to get them registered. Um, we also do hard copy applications for all our CCP high school population students because they have special requirements that we have to check. We do hard copy applications for our prisoners because they don't have internet access. And then we also do hard copy applications for our basic law enforcement training. They have some different requirements that they have to include. Okay. Here's some examples of our hard copy application. It's actually four pages. Um, this is where we get the student's primary information. There sometimes we cannot process it if we don't have a date of birth. We cannot process it, okay? Uh, sometimes they give us conflicting information and we have to figure it out, okay? Uh, one of the pages is selecting their student program of interest. One page is high school information and the other is just biographical. Okay, our CCP application, as I said, that's for our high school students. It is specific in that there are only certain programs. They have certain requirements, including a high school GPA, signatures based on the program they may be hoping to enter, and so we have a special application for them. Our electronic applications are done through CFNC. Now, we have that process and the link to CFNC embedded in our online application from the admissions homepage. Okay, okay so if we scroll down, all right, that isn't going to work. Can you scroll it down for me? Okay, right here, we click online. Thank you. It'll take us to the common application for North Carolina Community Colleges. It's branded with our own personal message that I update every semester and obviously our logo. The other way to do it through CFNC, students can actually go straight to the cfnc.org webpage. The beauty of doing the CFNC application is that students put the information <coughs> one time, all their biographical information, and then they just have to specify information or other requirements for the individual colleges. Most high school seniors have to do this anyway. During our peak periods, the records office may process five applications, but we only get one enrolled student, okay? So the ratio isn't what you would think it would be. When we talk about we've got 2,000 new students, we may have processed between eight and 10 applications for that student. Every time we process an application, we're handling the application, typically a high school transcript, a welcome letter, possibly an out-of-state letter, possibly a special credit letter, possibly other college transcripts. Okay. This one goes back to Jamie. <laughs> Thank you. Can you talk? Yes. Uh, placement testing. Who needs to do the placement test? Uh, any student that is doing a degree program, a diploma program, that has English or math or prerequisites for English and math in some of those courses. Um, good case in point would be the education um, courses require the um, English prerequisites. 
Um, and then there's also some certificate programs that require placement testing. The majority of them do not, but there are a handful that do. Um, some students are exempt from testing, such as if they bring in transferable credit, um, if they have AP or articulated credit has come through, um, or if they've already given us some acceptable placement test scores. Acceptable scores in the last five years, SAT, ACT, Compass, ACID, and Accuplacer are all acceptable tests that we will accept mm -hmm. just as long as they're in the last five years. Um, we administer the Accuplacer on all three of our campuses. So Pittsburgh, Billington, and Sanford is where we administer the Accuplacer. And we administer three sections. We administer reading comprehension, which consists of 20 questions, set skills, which consists of 20 questions. And as of Monday, um, the 17th of March, we will be going back to the NCDAP math. And that covers DMA 10 through 60, and that has a total of 72 questions. Eventually, we will implement the NCDAP English. Uh, we don't anticipate that until probably more closer to the fall. But that will replace the reading the sentences sections and that will encompass a reading and editing section as well as an essay. The testing format is approximately three hours long if you take the whole test. So we're talking about reading, sentences, and the NCDAT math. And it's computerized, so we do it uh, on the computers in our testing labs. We do have special format tests for students who um, have disabilities or they don't feel comfortable using the computer. So we have Braille, large print, and we also have audio CDs that we use through testing. And scores are instantaneous, so as soon as they test, we know what their scores are. So to take you to the placement testing webpage, there's a wealth of information on here, such as um, our current placement testing policies are there. And then we also have um, the curriculum scores that are required for all the um, English and math classes, and I'll go to that later. And then we have a release form where if they want to have their scores sent to another college, They'll need to complete that and give that to us. There are study guides that we have on our website. So we do have the new NCDAP map, map up there already with reading, review, and sentence review that they can do. And this tells students how to study. We highly encourage, studies to, we highly encourage students to study prior to testing. That way we have a great snapshot of their abilities when they come in to test. Um, and so um, this gives you a little bit more websites that they can study from or download web browser apps or an iPhone app uh, to get their studying done before testing. Uh, placement tests are put into TSOM. And so you'll see the reading and sentences sections will be put into this middle portion with their scores and the date that they test it. And then the DMA math courses um, are put down here in other testing. So you'll see the modules, the date they tested, and then the score they achieved on those modules. Also, um, underneath admissions tests, when someone has transferable English or math, that exemption will show in the top portion underneath admissions tests. So it'll say exempt English or exempt math. And then when we put in test scores, Non-course equivalencies are adding in the system behind the scenes. So you'll go to stack, and so when they have a seven or higher in a module, um, or 80 and higher in the reading, or, and so forth in the sentences at 86, you'll see the non-course equivalencies will come here. So for instance, this student had a seven or higher in 10 and 30, and the non-course equivalencies are designated by the NC in stack. Now I'll turn it over to Jamie. Okay, part of the whole process of getting into college is how are we going to pay for it? So paying for a college education is not for whims, okay? <laughs> You've got to go out there and find the money. And the first step is to apply for financial aid. Close to 50% of our students are on some form of financial aid. Whether it's scholarships or grants, they're going to have some assistance out there. Now, grants are basically need-based financial aid, okay? And we have several types. We've got the federal grants, most common is the Pell. Okay, we also have federal opportunity grants and the work study program. For state, we've got the community college grant and the lottery grant, okay? Okay, we also have students 
Closer to 5% of our students now are using veterans benefits. We used to know that as the GI Bill. They're not all called that anymore. The type of aid and how it's paid to the student is based on when their service <coughs> occurred. And then we have scholarships. CCCC has a scholarship program that is made possible through our foundation. However, the student must first complete the FAFSA and the scholarship application. There are deadlines for that. There are other resources on Financial Aid's webpage. Thank you. Okay. And because I'm not the financial aid guru, I'm not going to go into all of it, but on their website, they have the types of aid, the link to FAFSA, they have the scholarship information, how to apply, all the forms that might be needed after they've applied, how much it costs to attend CCCC, and then a lot of frequently asked questions. CCCC does not participate in loan programs. Okay? A lot of students, when they do their FAFSA and they get their student aid report back, it might say they qualify for Stafford or Perkins loans. We do not offer those. Okay, the process. The student can complete the FAFSA first or complete the CCCC application first. However, we're not going to pull that information in from FAFSA until an admissions application has been submitted. After they have applied to the college and the financial aid has been downloaded, the information, they might be selected for verification. Anywhere from a third to 50% of the students can be selected for verification, even more sometimes. But it's random. We don't pick them, okay? Department of Ed specifies. Now, students, in order to receive financial aid, also have to complete all admissions requirements. What I mean by that are those first three steps that are on the admissions checklist, okay? They have to complete the application. We have to have an official high school transcript that shows a graduation date. They can <coughs> say anticipated in five months. Okay, we've still got to get it in that says they officially graduated. If they've gone to another college, we need official college transcripts, and they need placement testing if the program has curriculum English or math. Okay? The student's program of study must be approved by Department of Ed in order to receive Pell funding, Title IV funding. Okay? If a student is in Diploma Cosmetology, it's not covered by Title IV funding. Funding. They can change to the associate level, but for it to be applicable for the current term, it must be done in the drop ad period. After the drop ad period, it applies to the next term. Okay. Oops. Back one. Let me also state that students who have received financial aid in the past still have to be eligible per our SAP policy. Now our SAP policy is students' academic progress. Students have to successfully complete 67% of the coursework they attempt in any given semester. A W is not successful completion. An incomplete is not successful completion. Okay. Obviously an F is not successful completion. Also, keep in mind when you're advising the student, students currently now this can change, part of it changes the rules every year, but they only have 30 hours of financial aid available for developmental aid. Most of our instructional record keeping is necessary for financial aid compliance. That's why most of the record keeping is there. That and funding. Um, so things like entry dates or never attends or the last date of attendance. Data tell. What is data tell? Colleague is the vendor. Okay, so colleagues data data tell is our database that we use for all human to college interactions. Right, whether it's prospects or applicants, employees, faculty and staff, vendors, okay, and alumni. 
They're all in data to help. Full-time faculty are gonna have access to the database to help with the advising process. Now I've got some mnemonics listed here. I've also got a list of these on the intranet for you, okay? These are the most common that you would use for advising students. I don't expect you to remember it all from this slide. So know that there's a cheat sheet that you can print and cut in half and share with your faculty member across the hall, because I've got it so you can cut it in half, the most commonly used mnemonics. Okay? TSUM, Jamie has already shared with you how to check that. The next place you'll want to look to help students is at their restrictions, their holds. That's on the PERC screen. Okay, that stands for personal restrictions. Now, there are only two types of holds that faculty advisors can end, and that would be an advising hold or an academic probation hold. Okay? You do not end an advising hold until you talk to the student about their plan. You do not end an academic probation hold until you ensure that they have successfully completed or at least registered for ACA 90. Never delete a hold. Okay? Any other type of hold can only be ended by the office that placed the hold on the student's account. Library hold. They have overdue books or some sort of material. There is a business office hold. Typically, they owe money. There are lots of holds out of the records office. That could be any number of reasons. Um, a new hold this past year is that the student did not start in the term in which they applied. So for federal reporting, we have to change that. We don't know to change it unless we put a hold there and it triggers us changing the start. Okay, another great tool is STAT, the student's academic transcript. I like this one better than actually the TRAN mnemonic because the student's GPA is right there for you, okay? You can see their GPA for any given term, and if you want to see what classes they took, you simply drill in. So it gives you both cumulative and semester GPAs. The stack screen that Jamie mentioned. This isn't only going to show you non-course credit from your testing, but also if the student had any transfer credit. This student submitted a transcript, but there was no credit awarded, okay? Remember to get transfer credit. The class must be applicable to your program of study. You must have earned a C or better in the class, and the class must be regionally accredited. RGN screen. This is where you actually register students, okay? Once you type in, their ID, you may need to adjust your default term. This might have said instead of 2014 fall, it may still say 2014 spring. Okay, if that's the case, you're actually going to type in 2014 FA before you type in the class to register them. During the pre-reg and open reg period, the registration status will be new. Once the class has begun, the registration status would change to A for add. D means drop, that's after a class starts. X means deleted, then W means the student withdrew. I have those on the cheat sheet. Okay. Eval, another powerful mnemonic for you. Data tell will do your work for you. If a student is actually in a specific program of study, you can do an evaluation on their progress. Okay, so first you're going to put in the student, and you're going to have to select which program. You can see this student is active in one and has changed his mind three times on the others. You can still do an evaluation on the other programs, okay? If, he's, if, he's, if you're not seeing the program, you can't do an evaluation on it. So, once you select which program, 
It's going to pull up your screen to ask you whether or not you want to look at courses in progress, which during the advising period you typically do. <clears throat> okay. It will then give you a PDF output. And what is beautiful about this, it's all there, all of it, okay? So you've got your advisor listing, you've got your students, email, contact information will be listed. You've got placement test scores there. You've got the program GPA. You've got a cumulative GPA. You've got what DataTel thinks is missing. How many hours is the kid missing, okay? Then as you scroll through, your program is broken into sections and you can see what the student is missing. Also note that it will tell you the catalog up here under the student information. It's going to tell you the catalog. That is very important because your program requirements have changed and are changing frequently and every program on this campus has been affected in the past year and everyone will be affected again in the next year, okay? So, if you keep looking, this student currently has a class in progress that will fulfill a requirement. And on the last page of the evaluation, you can see other courses that the student may have taken that don't apply toward their program of study. If a student needs their schedule printed, there are two ways you can do it. We all know that printing the reg statement at late registration doesn't really break it down for them quite as well, but it works similarly. You can go to STSC and view the student schedule. And with the new version of DataTel, you can actually export that to an Excel spreadsheet. Okay. The other way to do it is SCHD that'll print the student schedule. You have to make sure you put in the term and the specific student ID because you don't want to print all 5,000 students' schedules. SPRO, the student's record, okay? This is going to show what their address is within our system so you know whether or not the student might need to do a change of address. It'll show you what their current academic program is there in the middle of the screen and tell you when they started it. You can actually drill in there to see if they've bounced in and out of that program. Okay, it tells you who their current advisor is, whether or not they have any special student types like military dependent or basic law enforcement or CCP student. Null means we've ended a student type. A more extensive guide for DataTel revising is on the intranet. It is updated now with the new DataTel screenshots. Okay. And it's about 10 pages with a step by step <coughs> screenshot. Do this, do this, do this. Note, with all of our special sessions, okay, faculty will only be able to do drop ad during the first three days of the 16-week semester, okay? That's not really different than it has been. Now, the reason I say the first three days is because with our special sessions, I think most of the folks in this room know that you have to complete a drop ad of two courses in the same session in order for the student not to be billed any extra money after classes have started. But with our special sessions, that's not really possible because some of those ad periods are only a day. Some of them are two days. Some of them are three days. Some of them are as many as four days. Okay, the drop period is different for each of them too. So after the first three days of the 16 week semester, any drop ads will need to see a student <coughs> services counselor to do drop ad. Okay. Web advisor. This is DataTel's 
online user interface so that students and faculty and staff can access their information in Datatel, okay, when they're not on campus. Datatel only works within our intranet. WebAdvisor will work from the outside world. You can get to WebAdvisor from our homepage. It's up in the top right-hand corner. I'm sorry, Brian, I took the screen before Avizo was up there. It's between Avizo and Cougar Mail, okay? Once you log in to WebAdvisor, you're going to select the faculty menu. From the faculty menu, you're going to have several things that you can accomplish in WebAdvisor. Not just with record keeping for your courses like grading and attendance, but ways to help the student through advising. Those items would be my advisees, advisees, class rosters, search for sections, and express register. Also, the student file is going to take you to some key items too. If you click on my advisees, you're going to need to enter the term and then click submit and then you're going to select the student that you're advising. Okay. Scroll down, find the student, they're alphabetized, and then there's a drop-down menu of things you can do to help that student. You can look at their transcript, you can look at their schedule, or their test summary. You can evaluate their program from WebAdvisor. You can register the student, in two different ways. So once you've selected a student, you're going to scroll all the way to the bottom of the page, and your page might not be as long as mine. I've been here a lot of years. Then you'll click Submit. Once you do that, it's going to pull up the information for the student. Now what I was alluding to is that WebAdvisor can be somewhat cumbersome because the advisor assignments do not automatically end when a student graduates or drops off the face of the planet, okay? And right now, we don't have a process in place for that. It's all hand keyed, okay? So, I've been here a long time. My page is very, 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 very long, okay? <laughs> okay, now, you want to register the student from WebAdvisor and you know the classes that they need to take, particularly like you're doing a voc tech program and they're prescribed, you know, they're only shown at one time, then you can use Express Register. Okay? So you're going to pick the term and then you will simply key in the class, course number, and section. Tell it which term you're talking about. If you pick the wrong term, it won't let you do it. Okay? So don't worry. And then once you put all the classes in, you want to click Submit. I recommend Express Register because the search and register for sections, while possible, is excessive in the steps. It takes an extra four steps for each class. Okay. Uh, my predecessor did a very thorough job on a web advisor manual that's available on the intranet okay. and cover student advising in that web manual, in that web advisor manual, okay? okay. And we talked fast enough that we've got time for some questions and answers. <laughs> we didn't think we were going to do that. <laughs> Does anyone in this room have any questions or answers? Or questions, yeah, you may have answers. <laughs> you got any questions we can answer. When you were talking about the, the transcript part, so when you have students that are submitting in transcripts from other colleges, proprietary, non-profit, whatever the case may be, will you see the uh, credits, although we may or may not accept them on that page? No. Okay. We will not process that evaluation. Um, for a class that we can't give the student credit for. So the only thing you will see is the no credit awarded like I 
I displayed in the example. Now from the student's uh, SPRO record, their record, under demographics, you can click IASU, which is other institutions attended, and it'll tell you what colleges or what high schools the student went to, okay? And we pull that information primarily from the admissions application, but also their information they put on the FAFSA and their information they may supply to our veterans coordinator. So we don't only get that information from the application. Sometimes we get it from the National Student Clearinghouse. But we will not, we will not put a credit on their transcript for CCCC if it doesn't apply to their program of study. If a student changes their program of study, let's say they were at Sand Hills doing automotive tech and they came to us to do business, we're not going to bring those automotive classes in. If the student then changes his program of study, he needs to request for us to reevaluate his transcript. regard to high school transcripts, how about if a student was homeschooled, do they have a transcript? They do. Oh, okay. Homeschool students are required to submit a transcript. There are additional steps. Um, I need certification that the homeschool was registered with the North Carolina Department of Non-Public Education. I need two years of standardized testing. The homeschool transcript has to be from the homeschool signed by the administrator who registered with the Department of Non-Public Ed. It can't be a canned program that came from, I won't use a specific name, but XYZ out of Georgia, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, we do not, we only take a handful of online high school diploma programs. They are listed on the website. Uh, there are many that students, unfortunately, will go pay quite a bit of money for that we can't accept because they are diplomas. Yes, ma'am. So as we're encouraging the high school students to use CFNC, and I know there is a process there that if the school was something, they can have the transcript sent electronically from their high school yes. to yes. CCCC, right? Yes. So is that something that they're filling out on CFNC? And does it automatically do it or do they have to go to their to the school and say it's in the system please get my transcript yes and no okay okay when they complete and are going through the application process on cfnc there is a statement asking whether or not they would like to submit their transcript to the institutions to which they are applying if the student indicates through electronic signature that yes they would like it sent then we will download it with the application however Yes, we get the transcript, but the student might not have graduated yet. We will need another one once the graduation is showing on their transcript, so after graduation date. Currently, North Carolina public schools have switched to a new database known as Power Schools. It has been um, challenging, to say the least. They have not been able to manipulate everything they would like to. North Carolina Community College System and DPI, we are currently working together with CFNC so that we can download once um, mid-semester of their senior year when they first apply and tentatively be able to register students based on that transcript. However, a final transcript to be able to go back in and request that at a specific date. We were talking about June 15th, June 30th, and we were kicking that around several months ago at a meeting. They haven't worked out the technology yet. It's a goal. That's the question that we I've been getting working with the high school students. They they mentioned the fact that, oh, I clicked yes on CFC, yes. so you guys should have it. Yes. But as you're saying, they'll pull it midterm for the seniors, but we get that final final one when graduation is complete. Correct. And I have not been through the process after a student graduated, but it is my understanding that they can go in and request a transcript be resent to a specific school. I will not say I'm 100% on that because my children are too old, I haven't had to do it. Okay. 
So do you recommend us just having the student request the transcript just be sent to us just for expedient purposes? Yes. Okay. Or go and get one from their high school, leave it sealed. sealed and bring it. A transcript is not official if it is not still sealed, still sealed from the institution who issued it. Okay. We we can't have someone open it and then mom grab an envelope and put it in there and seal it again. It doesn't work that way. Okay. How do you guys handle electronic transcripts? A lot of what we're seeing currently is more and more schools are going to electronic transcripts and sending those in. Are you able to accept electronic versions? Yes, we are. Uh, we were one of the first Actually, I believe we were the first community college to issue electronic transcripts. We also have a policy in place to accept electronic transcripts. They must be sent from the institution, from a secure provider. They can't have been sent to Johnny and then Johnny forward it to us. <coughs> okay? And it typically needs to come either to the admissions email or to my email. And because we have that policy in place, when I print it, even though the PDF will say electronic transcript or not certified copy, I certify it with my signature and date. Perfect. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Um, we spoke about working with out-of-state students and that we're, I know you were mentioning we're trying to put a hold to just kind of alert us when we have one that we've indicated might be out. What would an advisor see if a student had that hold on their account? They would see RO, okay. registrar's, off, registrar's office, okay? If they then drilled into, will you go to the yeah, park screen? So the screen? There's a place where you can drill in, mm -hmm. and I will typically have a note there okay. about why I've placed a hold. And you're the only one that can remove it, is that correct? My office is the only one that can remove it. Okay. Okay, so if you look at our PERT screen, this tells you the different types of holds. Um, you can see that the military dependent form is a hold from my office. <coughs> That's a waiver for tuition so that they're paying in-state rates. Uh, you will notice that that one doesn't have a comment. Uh, the, the not enrolled in start term has a comment. If you clicked on the icon to drill in, it would tell you student did not enroll in specified start term. Now, the reason that hold is there is because our federal and state reporting has gotten a little more specific. And so we have to actually go into the system to about four different places and change that start term from what they indicated on their application. So that's why you have to call us so we know to go fix that. <laughs> Good questions. Anyone else? Harnet or Pittsburgh or streaming? We're okay. Okay. <laughs> Anything else you'd like to add? No. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank, Thank you. you. Did we finish? Good job. Yeah.